This video started as a review of Genjutsu no Yohane. The more I thought about it, the more I realized my thoughts were tied into Love Live as it stands today. Recently, I rewatched the entirety of the Love Live series with two of my friends, and it gave me time to really reflect on the series overall, from humble beginnings to its modern form. Much like the spin-off itself, modern Love Live is familiar yet distinctly different, for better or for worse. Sunshine in the Mirror, upon its release, received a mixed response. For me, I tend to agree with a lot of the criticisms of the show, but not to as strong a degree. I got a general vibe of impatience from the community with the show, both with the plot sidelining and the underutilization of the fantasy setting. I was also a bit impatient with the plot progression of the story, at least at first, as I wasn't as bothered upon rewatch. It's fine, but nothing exceptional. Expectation likely was a big reason for the dislike sent towards this spin-off, as many went in expecting Yohane to use magic to fight off monsters, whereas the reality, that at worst, a few deer are all that challenge her. I read the manga to see if it was similar, and actually, the manga had far more combat therein. Rather than the Calamity, it's special crystals that cause animals to go berserk. In fact, Lilaps doesn't even speak. Kanon and Yo essentially had their chapters merged into what became episode 4 of the anime, which sounds lazy, but practically, it stops character episodes from eating up 70% of the anime. What does GNY do with that extra time? Uh, not too much. For me, the first half of GNY is generally fairly consistent, but some problems start to emerge in the second half. The character episodes themselves range from more meh to an enjoyable watch, but with the exception of episodes 7, 9, and 12, the latter half succumbs to poor writing. Of these, the worst two are absolutely episodes 10 and 11. The first being a worse version of an already boring episode 8, and 11 removing all tension from the end episode cliffhanger by having Chica scare the deer away immediately. It feels almost like a taunt to those hoping for real combat, but there's a more important reason I'm targeting these episodes in particular. Just about every anime series in Love Live has been written by the same writer, Juki Hinata. To be clear, the same man who wrote Superstar Season 2 also wrote the entirety of Muse and Sunshine. Sunshine in the Mirror was written by Toshia Ono. Mostly. Now, Superstar is being worked on at the same time as GNY, so casting someone else to not overburden Hanada makes sense. What doesn't make sense is the fact that episodes 10 and 11 are written by someone else entirely. Their name is Kakuzo Nanmanji. If you don't recognize their name, I don't blame you. Want to guess how many shows they worked on prior to GNY? ONE! For three non-sequential episodes! Wh what? Look, we all have to get our start somewhere. There's nothing wrong with hiring new talent. Well, talent, anyway. But the fact this decision was made at all both worries and utterly baffles me. I don't have a deep understanding of the industry to understand why this happened, but I have some possible ideas why. The first, and most cynical, is that for one reason or another, the higher-ups needed a cheap fill-in and went with the cheapest option, completely disregarding the narrative quality. Realistically, though, I think it's more likely that Ono got sick or busy for some reason, and they just scrambled to find someone to fill in for him momentarily, and some guy looking for experience just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I hope Kakuzo can go on to have a fulfilling career, it's just... This is Love Live! Juki Hinata and Toshio Ono both have ample amounts of writing experience, so... Why would the staff throw the weight of the story onto somebody with such an unremarkable resume? Hi, Future Ghost here. Turns out Card Fight Vanguard is another big Bushiroad property, so it does make sense that a fill-in for that show would get involved with GNY. The point about his resume still stands, though. Oh yeah, did you notice when I talked about Juki Hinata I failed to mention one series? That's right, Niji is its own mess. Mostly, Niji is written by Jin Tanaka. He is no slouch when it comes to a resume either, given that he wrote 153 episodes of One Piece. Niji is a different beast from the rest of the Love Live series, much more slice of lifey and focusing less on a grand narrative of winning Love Live, and taking a more leisurely exploration of these characters. Given Niji only got an anime because the fans begged them for one, I can't help but feel like they didn't know what to do with Niji. Ditching a typical formula to focus on the characters makes sense if this is true, after all, 
if fans love these characters so much, why wouldn't they be the focus? Unfortunately, Niji felt lacking in a lot of aspects to me. With the story becoming basically irrelevant and the characters' episodes being a mixed bag, the highlight for me being Rina's episode. Now here's the thing, Jin Tanaka was the lead writer for Niji, but the writing was split up between four writers! The other three assisted with episodes 5, 7, 8, 10, and 11 in season 1, and episodes 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11 in season 2. That's a very deliberate pattern, and I can't help but wonder if this broader writing team was made to help find and focus Niji's direction. If I haven't made it clear enough already, something bizarre is going on behind the scenes. Maybe this is the fall of bureaucrats and higher-ups, or maybe this is a more complicated matter. I don't have the resources to confirm or deny either hypothesis, but I think I might know what could be part of the problem. Love Live wants to reimagine itself. Although massive, Love Live is only one of many idol properties, even under the Bushi Road umbrella. Throughout Muse and Sunshine, the message the series wanted to send was that together, people can achieve great things. There's a reason Sunny Day's song is more than just Muse, but all the up-and-coming idols participating in the festival. It's why there's an emphasis on the students of Uranahoshi in Sunshine. That message hasn't faded, and is a core aspect in both Nichi and Superstar. Even in GNY, the villagers of Numazu are of great importance to the show. The calamity symbolizes the disconnect between people, brought to an end when they all connect through song. Now that I think about it, the villagers weren't quarreling at all in the show. In fact, outside of the main cast, everyone seems perfectly happy and kind to one another. Wasn't the calamity supposed to be brought about by general miscommunication among the populace? No wonder Yohane blames herself! Her and Lylops are the only ones fighting at this point in the story! I guess it's not a huge deal, given Yohane and the others are examples of those who don't fit in, or have discord with one person or another. Just a little nitpick. Even with these core aspects intact, the new properties still feel fresh with their ideas. Niji deviates from the typical story-focused love life plot, and has the largest cast at 13 characters. Leela was the first to start with a 5-person cast. GNY was the first spin-off series, and acts as a way to revitalize Aqua. It's just that, they seem held back by really baffling creative decisions. Leela is the best example of this, making the unique decision to have only 5 members, which at the time excited me. It gave them a chance to intermingle with one another more closely than in any previous series, without the pressure of accommodating a huge cast. That was a smart idea. The problem is, they added more! TWICE! Superstar Season 2 isn't as bad in my opinion as other fans make it out to be, but the expanding cast and the absolute flop that was the narrative direction prevented the newbies from gaining the same interconnectedness. Not to me especially. I'm biased towards Shiki though. I love Shiki. Another problem with the expansive cast is that it pushed other characters apart. The emotional buildup to the Kiki Sumire episode in Season 2 was completely botched by the two of them taking a backseat to the first years, and lacking the proper weight that the scene was supposed to carry. It just didn't feel earned to me. Speaking of divisions, the whole first years are not as good as second years plotline, terrible, obnoxious, nauseating, synonyms. The decision makes sense thematically, but practically the execution tears the cast in half, ruining the tight-knit five-person dynamic of Superstar Season 1. Kanon was a highly relatable character, overcoming her social anxiety, and being able to achieve great things not just with Leela, but on her own, because to her, even when singing solo, she isn't truly alone. Superstar Season 1 Episode 11 got a tear out of me when Kanan sang Watashi no Symphony. That was the most impacted love life made me feel since Sunshine. In Season 2, however, she's just the fun, quirky leader, gutting everyone around her because she's just cool like that, without the narrative weight that made Hanukkah great when she gutted Muse. It's genuinely baffling that both these seasons are written by the same person. So, is Love Live on a downward trajectory? In my opinion, no. Although my thoughts on the series have been more cynical than they used to be back in my early days of Sunshine, I don't think Love Live is on a steep decline, but rather a rocky transitional phase. For all the numerous problems I stated in this video, there are still positives I think shouldn't be ignored. Remember earlier in the video where I said GNY underutilized the fantasy element? Blaze in the Deep Blue sure didn't. As someone who has craved a Love Live combat scenario for years, Blaze in the Deep Blue filled that hole. 
There's no possessed deer, but rather, isopods with blade arms, huge fish with battle axes, giant flying crab dragons, you name it. And that's just the regular enemies. You have bosses like a pirate ghost, an enormous lava fish, and even an anomalocaris tank. If you put an anomalocaris in your game, it instantly becomes 10 times better. And that's just facts. As someone who beat Metroid Dread and put a substantial amount of time into it, Blaze in the Deep Blue was comparatively a bit more empty in its level design, but as a Metroidvania, it still is very solid. Putting Inti Creates behind the reins for this game was a smart decision. They're familiar with 2D sprite-based games, and thus were the perfect fit for this game. Everything GNY left me wanting, Blaze in the Deep Blue provided in spades. Outside of Blaze in the Deep Blue, there are positive signs for the main series too. Remember how people were unhappy about the five character dynamic of Leela being spoiled in later iterations? I think the staff may have listened more than people give them credit for, because Hasun Osura, a six person group, now exists. I do not know a great deal about them because I admittedly haven't been keeping up, but I've heard good things about them from both a character and narrative standpoint. New Love Live and Old Love Live are never going to be like one another. The more you look, even beyond just narrative, you start to realize how different they are. In Muse and Sunshine, there were a few of what we'll call washy washy moments. Everyone knows Nozomi, but Mari is actually just about equally a perpetrator. Do you know of any of these moments in Niji or Superstar? I bet you can't, because there isn't. Recently, I heard a few people note that in Muse, the pretend everyone is a vegetable joke felt more like a Kaon joke than a Love Live joke. Back when these series first aired, SA in anime as a joke was more commonplace than it is today, and was likely discarded in pursuit of the more general audiences Leela is aiming for. That or it's just the changing times. Even the art styles have shifted. Muse and Sunshine were about the same in art style, but Niji, Superstar, and GNY all have their own unique styles that makes them stand out. Of these, Superstar benefits the best in my opinion, offering a more expressive range of emotions that helps assist the comedy of the show. There's even a few moments in GNY where Yohane makes expressions that use a more cartoony, bochi-esque style. These are just a few of the things that have changed about Love Live over time. As the old saying goes, change is the only constant, and that's no different for this series. There will come a day when Aqua disbands, there will come a day when Superstar is old news, and there will come a day when Juki Hinata writes for Love Live for the final time. Muse's anime first aired January of 2013, and as unrecognizable as the series must feel to them now, 11 years later in 2024, Leela fans will likely look back similarly on a vastly different series come 2035. Here's the thing. Muse was the origin of the series. The grassroots that kicked off the School Idol project, and much like the ending of the movie, Muse forever laid the groundwork that every series in Love Live owes its existence to, and nothing can replicate that. Sunshine was the first series to follow Muse, and had one of, if not the greatest narrative this series has to offer. This was the series that got me hooked on Love Live, and would go on to define my YouTube career. It also gave us Chica, who saved me from a low point in my life. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Chika Takami saved my life. Love Life Sunshine is my favorite series of all time for this profound connection to it, and nothing can replicate that. Niji Gisaki was a celebration of the mobile games, featuring the cast of All Stars, and even some of the lesser known faces from the original School Idol Festival. With both All Stars and School Idol Festival now gone, the series serves as a preservation of that time in Love Live's history, taking its first steps to a new face for the series as it is today, and nothing can replicate that. Superstar carried on the more traditional style of Love Live, but did so in a unique way. Kanon is to me one of the most relatable Love Life protagonists, overcoming her social anxiety in one of the most impactful moments modern Love Life has to offer. Superstar is a culmination of the series' new direction, trying new things, and despite all the bumps, still makes characters, music, and for season 1, a narrative that can still be well written and make me still adore the series. Superstar is the first iteration of Juki Hinata's writing prowess in the new Love Live era, and nothing can replicate that. Genjutsu no Yohane gave Aqua a new coat of paint, becoming the very first spin-off anime the series has ever had. By giving Yohane the spotlight, the rest of the cast gets to have unique explorations of their characters. What if Riko got her dorky side of her personality emphasized, free from the narrative connection to Chika? What if Mari never had Kanan and Daya to keep her company, 
and was truly all alone. What if Yohanai really did have magic? This spin-off gave Aqua new life, and a lot of first glimpse of what such ambition can do for Love Live going forward. And nothing can replicate that. Love Live has always been changing. For all the faults with modern Love Live, I can see genuine talents and creativity being put into the series. The step forward has been rocky, sure, but Love Live as it stands today is far from irredeemable. Besides, what's so wrong with being different? For how many people are nostalgically reflecting on Sunshine and Muse, I think it's worth remembering that when Sunshine released, people called it just another Muse, and Chica was called Hanukkah 2.0. What they wanted was something they didn't see as Muse again, something that was different. Well, they got their wish, and I hope they're happy, because I am. And that was where I was going to end the video, until this happened. I hadn't planned to talk about School Idol Festival 2 in this video, as I have done so extensively already, but this is too big to ignore. The first idea I had to wrestle with after discovering this information was whether or not this would alter the message of the video. I mulled over it for a while, but eventually reached the conclusion that it doesn't, and let me explain why. The bizarre overreach that hurt Leela and GNY is demonstrated more clearly here than anywhere else. There was no reason to annihilate two games, just to rush out an unfinished sequel, and the worst part is, the damage control has been downright pathetic. Bushiro did put out a brief formal apology tweet, but any sympathy is dampened by their near constant begging for followers and media attention. I think it should be kept in mind though, this is not a standalone sudden disaster, but the result of several stupid decisions putting Bushiroad into a lose-lose situation. Either let the unpopular game run for a while and take a big financial hit, or cut it off early and make what money you can back. It's a business decision. It takes money to keep gotchas alive and fresh with new content. You have artists, coders, and all sorts of employees you have to pay, and Cephas was not bringing those returns in. In fact, in my research, I discovered something. It's not entirely the devs to blame, it's not even anything about Love Live that's to blame. It's this. On August 14th, 2023, Bushiroad put out this statement about its earnings. I'm no expert in economics, but the statement says their shares halved in value from the previous year, and when we line up the day of the report with the Bushiroad stock, we find this. Love Live is suffering because Bushiroad is going through a period of big economic troubles. This is the second lowest the stock price has gotten, and this time, the stock price isn't bouncing back. Oddly enough, this is the stock around All-Stars EOS announcement, and the day it ended service, all but confirming it was the stock price announcement to blame. With this in mind, I'm not as optimistic as I was at the original end of this video, but at the same time, I feel a little relieved that Bushiroad is quite literally paying for their dumb decisions. Love Live, and it seems Bushiroad, are indeed going through a rough patch, and this has to be a serious wake-up call to the higher-ups. I don't know how they'll salvage Love Live from here, but like I said before, there are signs they can listen to their fans and deliver. I think they can bounce back. After all, Bushiroad isn't just Love Live, it's a card game company. Thanks for watching. Thank you.